I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Greetings and salutations. Welcome to another fabulous day in the Lord's neighborhood. And to another episode of Coffee, the Bible, and Page. I'm Page, your caffeine-imbued host. Here is my coffee. Hmm. In the beginning, coffee and low. It was very good. couple things before we get started. Uh, if you hear anything in the background, it's my lovely wife teaching piano lessons. And uh, this is the only time I'd be able to record this today. So I figured if you hear the piano going on or voices in the background, that's my wife. You might also hear my dog whining a little bit because I'm dog-sitting while I'm doing this. So I'm multitasking. She, My dog's in her crate, and she's got a little blanket over her, so she thinks she might be needing to go to sleep, but you never can tell. Sometimes she talks. All right, today we are going to be reading Mark chapter 14, where it details the illegal trial of Jesus, the arrest and, the tri- and his trial. And I'm going to read it through from beginning to end without commenting on it and then going then I'm going to go back into certain sections and and comment so I'm going to read it beginning to end so we just get the whole flow of the story and then I'll go back and make some comments on it at least that's my intention sometimes though when I start to think with my mouth open stuff happens all right so let's get started chapter 14 Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus and to kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. While he was in Bethany reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly indignantly to one another, Why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She's done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand them over. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples telling them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house that he enters, The teacher asks, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left and went into the city and found things just as Jesus had told them, so they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve, and while they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely, surely you don't mean me. It's one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, 
which is poured out for many. He said, Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered. Today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with them, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything's possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayers. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared, and with him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you've come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus, and when they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and the teachers of the law came together, and Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but They did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even then their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists, and said, Prophesy! And the guards took him and beat him. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, This fellow is one of them. Again he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, Surely you're one of them, for you're a Galilean. He began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately the rooster crowed the second time. 
Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. All right. Now let's go back and share a few thoughts here. Took some notes from my uh, NIV study Bible, which helped clear them some things up for me. Get it back up here to the beginning. First thought. When the, when the woman poured the perfume on him. It was Jewish custom to give gifts to the poor because they said what we could have sold this and given money to the poor. Well, it was Jewish custom to give gifts to the poor on the evening of the Passover. John, in his gospel, specifically identifies Judas Iscariot as making this complaint. And he goes on to say because Judas was taking money so he was kind of greedy. And he, Jesus goes on to explain, she poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Now, it was normal Jewish custom to anoint a dead body with aromatic oils in preparing it for burial. Jesus is seeming to anticipate suffering a criminal's death. For only in that circumstance was there a no anointing of the body. He was going to die as a criminal. His body would not be anointed. So he's saying, well, she's anointing my body beforehand. When they were getting ready to have the final Passover meal, he sends his disciples into the city and says, to find somebody carrying a jug of water. And he said, uh, the teacher asked, where's my guest room? Where may I eat the Passover with my disciples? Well, it was a Jewish custom that anyone in Jerusalem who had a room available would give it upon request to a pilgrim who asked for it to celebrate the Passover. So this wasn't anything strange. This was actually according to Jewish custom. And then when he's having his supper and he's breaking bread and he, say, he announces someone's going to betray me, and he says, one who dips bread into the bowl with me, it's just another way of saying one who shares closest fellowship with me, one of my inner circle of 12. All right, the, one of you 12 is going to betray me. That's what he's talking about there. Now, he says when he's given the, uh, the break, breaks of bread, he says, this is my body, and he pours the wine, he said, this is my, the blood of the covenant poured out for you. He says, I won't drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. It probably means he's not going to celebrate Passover again until he does so in the kingdom at the messianic banquet that we find in Isaiah chapter 25. Um. You will all fall away, Jesus told them. So, and then he, he quotes, I think it's Zechariah, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. He says, but after I've risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. He wasn't saying the disciples will lose their faith. He just says they would become very afraid and they'd run away. Their courage will, will fail them. Peter makes his declaration. Now Jesus is arrested. Um... Peter is identified in John's gospel as the one who struck off the servants here. And now Jesus says, am I leading a rebellion that you come out with swords and clubs to capture me? He's talking to this crowd that came with, with Judas. Everyone deserted him and fled. Uh, it was a chaotic scene, apparently. Jesus is, when he says the scripture must be fulfilled, he's probably referring to Zechariah 13, where it says the shepherd struck and the sheep were scattered. Awake, sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is close to me, declares the Lord Almighty. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. In Zechariah 11, it was the worthless shepherd who was to be struck, but now it is the good shepherd, in the verse I just quoted. Sheep will be scattered in partial fulfillment of the curses of the covenant disobedience. These two clauses are quoted by Jesus not long before his arrest, here in Mark, and applied to the scattering of the apostles, saying, he told them before, you're all going to scatter. You're all going to leave. Now, a young man wearing nothing but a linen garment, linen garment was following Jesus. Some scholars believe this was Mark himself. This is the only gospel this incident happens. Uh, the fact that he's wearing a linen undergarment is showing that he was probably from a fairly wealthy family, and that would fit with the description of John Mark as we find in the book of Acts, who accompanied Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey, uh, and later became a companion of Peter. Now, Jesus, they took Jesus to the high priest, his home. 
All right, and they're going to they're going to have a trial. Now, there's The trial described by Mark that we just read about is highly irregular. And here's the things that the rules that are broken. Capital cases were to be tried during daytime. They were trying to get Jesus killed, so this is a capital case. And the verdict must be reached during daytime. This is reached during the nighttime, before the crow, before the rooster crowed, before the sun came up. They were having this trial in the night. Trials were not to be conducted on a Sabbath eve or on the eve of a festival. They were doing this on the eve of the Passover festival. Capital cases were supposed to begin with reasons for acquittal and not with reasons for conviction. They, they never asked for anybody to stand up and say, should we acquit him? They went right to why he was guilty. Verdicts of acquittal could be reached on the same day, but verdicts of conviction must be confirmed on the following day after night's sleep. So if they found him guilty, they were supposed to go to bed, sleep on it, and then come back and reaffirm the conviction or to turn it over. They convicted him right away. This He was railroaded. Condemnation required the, the confirmation, the evidence of two witnesses. And if two witnesses disagreed, their evidence was null and void. Well, they couldn't get any two witnesses to agree on anything. So the witnesses should have been thrown out. Their supposed evidence should have been thrown out. And Jesus should have been acquitted because there was no witness that would, uh, two witnesses that would agree. And the Mishnah, which is writings, some Jewish writings, assumes that the Sanhedrin met in the inner course of the temple, chamber of hewn stone, not in the high priest's home. You're not supposed to meet in the high priest's home. They're supposed to be meeting in a court. So everything about this just screams kangaroo court. This was an unjust trial, and their sole purpose was to go through the motions to get Jesus killed. Now, they couldn't kill Jesus. They had to deliver him to the Roman authorities, and we're going to see that in the next chapter. And, of course, Peter disowns Jesus, as Jesus said he would. Man, next two chapters are going to be heavy duty. I'm going to stop here because there's a lot to think about, and um, there's not much more to be said. The, the narrative kind of explains itself, doesn't it? So with that, ladies and jelly spoons, I'm Paige. Here's my coffee. And I am out of here. Have a great day. Bye-bye. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. Neither should my thoughts be your thoughts. You need to think for yourself.